Hey everybody, welcome back. In today's episode, I want to show you my stupidly simple process for deploying a Ruby on Rails application to a web server. As you probably know from watching my channel, Ruby on Rails is my favorite language for developing web applications. I think it's a great platform for beginners to learn because of the easy syntax and all of the opinions baked into the Rails application framework, which makes developing web applications easy. Now, while development of your application may be simple, deployment may be a different story. A lot of beginners get tripped up on how to deploy a Rails application because the process can be quite complex. For a very long time, the most popular way of deploying Rails applications has been the use of a tool called Capistrano. But Capistrano isn't really updated for the Docker container era. If you're trying to deploy your application using Docker with Capistrano, you're going to run into problems and it's not going to work very well unless you make many custom configurations to your Capistrano setup. So for my applications, I came up with a very simple way of doing this. I don't use Capistrano. Lately, I've been using a very simple bash script that I wrote where it downloads the latest code from the repository and then it will build the Docker images and reload the Docker containers. And here's how it works. Here we're in the main directory for my website, ustreasuryyieldcurve.com. The project I have is called Ycurve Rails. And I just did a massive update to my program. And I'm going to commit these changes. If we do a git log, we can see the latest commit that I've made, which was adding the initial estimates of GDP. So you could see that as a feature on the website. Now I'm going to start off by deploying this latest commit to the staging server. But first I'm going to show you what's inside of my bash script that does deploy and give you an overview of how it works. Here is my project in the IntelliJ editor. I have this script here called deploy.bash. So let's take a look at what's inside here. So it has an option here where you could set the branch by an environment variable. In this case, we're deploying the main branch. And as you can see here, I committed to the main branch. When the script runs, it tells you which branch it's working off of. It should say main in most cases. And then it performs a fetch of the Git repository, and then it checks out the origin branch. So on my main web server, I basically just have the Git repository in the application folder, and we're going to be running the code just from the Git repository. You'll see this in action in just a moment. So once the main branch is checked out, it sets the environment to production, and then it runs this docker compose command and runs a compose file. There's a main docker compose file, which has the main settings for the program, as well as a few specialized settings for production mode. This is a feature in Docker where you could specify specific files to run when you're running the docker compose command. And notice that the first command that runs is the build command. So in this particular setup, I'm doing the build of the docker container on the production server. Probably not optimal, but it works for now. I'm going to talk about how we could improve on this a little bit later. Let's take a look inside of my docker compose file and I'll show you what exactly it's building. So the main thing it's building here is this web service. And this is the main application that's running. I have it in a container called White Curve Web, and it has a database dependency. So my Postgres database, that's also running in Docker. It doesn't have to be running in Docker, but I find this really convenient for doing database maintenance. If I wanted to, I could have a separate database server, but this works for now. I have an entry point file called docker-entry.bash. This just does a little bit of cleanup in case the server crashed, and then it runs whatever command that you want it to run. It also sets some environment variables by default, sets it to always restart in case the server reboots, and the standard in open and TTY need these for development mode so that I could use binding pry breakpoints in my code. Now, I also have another service called daemon, which uses the same container name up here. It uses the image WAC Productions Y Curve Latest, which is the same image name used here. So when we run this build command here, uh, docker compose build, it's going to build this here. It's going to refer to this building the main application. And so that way, 
web and daemon share the same docker image. I set the log file to be different for the daemon. Basically what this does is it's running the background jobs such as updating the interest rate information from the treasury. So this, this is running all the tasks and jobs that need to keep the data updated on the website while this is the main web server itself. If you notice the command here is different, we're using a rake task, rake y curve run update daemon. And in my code here, the, the daemon is uh, running all these different service classes in the background that do these background jobs. And the sleep command keeps the container active. So we do the build and then it runs the asset precompile stage. What this does is it runs the Ruby on Rails asset pipeline. Basically, the Rails asset pipeline is a way of caching things like image files and JavaScript files or CSS files. It compresses them and it builds them once so that it's easy for your web server to serve them from this cache. It's easier for the web server to serve such files from a cache where it's already been built versus trying to recompile them on the fly every single time. To learn more about the Rails asset pipeline, I highly recommend going to the Rails guides on rubyonrails.org and reading this entire article. The difference of how Rails serves static assets in production versus development is one point of frustration for when you're doing a Rails deployment. Now going back here, I have this thing build the Docker image and then it does a tag. And then here's where it restarts the server. It does a Docker compose down, so it shuts down the application application, it relaunches it. There was a particular reason I don't use the docker compose restart command. I probably can, but I remember running into a problem when I initially wrote this script and I don't quite remember exactly what it was. But I found it to be more effective to just shut down the docker container and then tell it to restart from scratch. And this little D flag runs it as a daemon, so it's running as a background job. You don't need to keep a, a terminal window open. So let's go ahead and deploy using this script. Here we are on a command line. First, we got to push up this latest code. So we'll do a uh, git push. Now the code's out there on the main branch of the repo. And I just want to show you what this website looks like first. On my local network, I have the domain set up for staging that ustreasuryyieldcurve.com to go to my staging site. This is something that's on my local network here and is not accessible outside on the internet. I'm going to log on to my staging server, SSH, Chaustella is what it's called. I built this server in a previous episode on my channel. So here we're on the server. Now I'm going to go to the application directory. Now if we do ls, we could see our application files there. This is also a git, git repository that I set up. So if we do git log, we can see that this doesn't have that latest commit that I made. So I'm going to run the deploy that batch, and then it's going to run all of those steps that I just showed you in my bash script. This process actually takes a little while to run, and it's the slowest part of doing a deploy. I don't really think it's a good practice to have my Docker container being built on the production server. So I'd like to change this and use a Docker repository for these containers and build them on my local machine, push that up to the cloud, just like I do with the Git repo. If I have the image already built on GitHub and I pull it, then that should save the time and the CPU energy being used to build that container. And it could just do the pull and then restart. For now, having it build on a production server works for me. And and that's okay. It works and I haven't had a problem with it yet. Now there's one thing that I really need to do in order to get that latest data up. I wrote a special migration in my application that loads the data because I don't have it in the database yet. So I'm going to have to do that through the Rails console. And I'm going to get to my Rails console by using docker compose exec web. Oh, by the way, first let's see what the container is running. So we could see the containers are running on this server. I've got the Y curve web and Y curve daemon. Uh, I'm going to use the Docker compose to get into my Rails console on this Y curve web container. Okay, so now I could run the special migration command that I made. Let me show you how I'm gonna run it. So in my services directory, 
I have these special one-time load interactor classes, and I have them named for each deploy that I'm doing. And I have this deploy populate GDP revisions class, and I just have to run this call routine. What that's going to do is it's going to do several things. It's going to fix up some erroneous data that I have in the database currently, and then it's going to load the GDP revision data that I have. So this runs a special import process. I've got all of the data that I want to load in this file, BA archive. Uh, it's sitting here in the repository as a uh, CSV file. Uh, those are the initial estimates that I am going to load. And then it's going to run the update real GDP process, which loads it into another table. Uh, this is all application logic. It's not really important what this does. The important thing I want to show you is that I do have this one-time load migration that I'm going to run manually. All right, looks like that's done. So if we go back to the application on staging, we should see the new feature and the data loaded. So I'm going to exit out of here and I'm going to exit out of my server. We're going to go back to this application. I'm going to hit refresh. One feature I add was that the zero line indicator is emboldened here a little bit. And that's a new aesthetic that I've added. If we go down here, we could see I have the initial release and latest version of the data. So now we should have two new lines appearing on the chart. And there you go. We have the initial estimate of the quarterly growth, olive colored line. And then we have the um, bright green line, which is has the latest revision. So that's the overview of my very simple Rails dockerized deployment system. It's just a really simple script that builds a container. It pulls the code repo and then it builds a container and then it restarts it and runs the application. Now, obviously, there are some scalability limits to the system. For example, if I had multiple servers, I would have to run this process on each server, and it's probably not a good idea to do that manually. You'd probably want to automate that task, and you could probably easily do that using a CI tool like Circle CI. But if you just need one server and you want to get an application out there for demo reasons or prototyping something, this works great. It's quick and easy to set up. USTreasuryYieldCurve.com has over 50,000 unique visitors a month. At any point in the day, about 200 users on it. Using one server has been just fine. You could get a lot done with a single web server. Now, another tool that you might want to look into is this new Rails community tool called Kamal. And that is officially used by the Ruby on Rails creator, DHH supports it, and from what my understanding is, that's what they use at Basecamp to do their deploys. But the reason that I don't really like Kamal so much is because it has its own syntax and configuration for running your Docker containers, and I haven't figured out how to use that yet with Docker Compose. Because if I could get all the Docker configuration that I need done using Docker Compose, why would I want to learn another YAML configuration for deploying with Kamal using its own syntax? That doesn't make any sense to me because Docker Compose is great. And then if you're doing enterprise level applications, the method of choice is probably going to be through Kubernetes. But Kubernetes I found to be a very complex system on its own. You need to use specialized cloud services to get that set up and it has its own domain knowledge, its own level of expertise to run a Kubernetes site because there are multiple components to running it. And one of the things I don't like about Kubernetes is it really obstructs your access to the running code. You have to use a whole host of third-party tools to manage your Docker containers. Uh, well, in um, Kubernetes language, they call Docker containers pods to manage the pods and all the services managing the pods, you have to use a special set of command line tools and it gets very complicated to deal with. This being a simple script is great because if I have an idea for an application I want to test or I want to show somebody, I just take this script and I've been involving the script over time, I drop it into my project 
and then I set up the folder on the production server, set up Nginx, by the way, I have another video on that, and then I'm all good to go. I could get the application up and running very quickly without a lot of specialized knowledge. So I hope you found this to be a useful video. That's one way you could deploy your Rails applications. If you like it, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next time.